Okay, I don't know if anyone remembers the video series I did about a year and a half ago on the TS520, the Kenwood. I took the Kenwood through a complete restoration. Basically, we had to change capacitors. We had to do some repairs inside. I had to, uh, you know, figure out how the thing worked, go through the schematics, uh, do an alignment. Uh, there were some... Uh, lamp change-outs to LEDs, and it was a whole bunch of fun. And uh, I'll link to the description on the TS520 uh, restoration videos that I did. But I've managed to lay my hands on a Yesu, a classic FT-101 Yesu. And this series is going to kick off, you know, the repair and restoration of this classic rig that really... I think you have to consider this rig to be a, a change, a sea change in ham radio equipment manufacturing. All of the great American companies and uh, many of the European companies around the world that uh, produced fine ham equipment in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the early 70s suddenly had a, a wake-up call. And that wake-up call came from Japan. And uh, how impressive was it? How much of a fundamentals change was the FT-101? Well, let me tell you, when this thing hit, some thought it was going to be a laughing matter or a joke or nobody's going to buy these rice boxes. Forget it. The hams are going to stick with their Drakes, their Heaths, their Hammerlands, the Collins uh, Reign Supreme. We're never going to buy these rice boxes, these Japanese radios. But uh, when I saw my first uh, FT-101 at a field day in the early 70s, I was shocked. It was uh, probably like a soldier who had been using a bolt-action rifle arrived at boot camp and had an M1 thrust into his hands. Uh, this was uh, almost like a ray gun to him. Well, that's what the FT-101 was to those of us that were used to uh, nicotine-covered uh, NCX-3s. It was a completely different ball game. So it's going to be really interesting going over this transceiver, learning about the modular uh, approach that uh, Yesu took with, uh, with the construction. I know zero about this radio. I've never actually used one even. I have never used an FT-101 on the air or even been exposed to one where I played with it or tuned it. So this is a completely new radio to me. So uh, let's get ready on this adventure and uh, we'll start at the beginning. Is the FT-101 really the radio? Yesu of Japan was founded in 1959 by radio amateur Sako Hasegawa, Japan Alpha One, Mexico Peter, in Yesu, Japan. It's actually a district in Tokyo. Yesu had initially been formed with the intention to develop and manufacture both commercial and amateur radio transceivers for just the Japanese market. But about five years after its formation of the company, they started to sign foreign sales agreements to export. Basically, they started with Australia and Germany. In 1964, the company changed its name to the Yesu Musing Company Limited. Many radios were developed during this 1960 to 65 time frame. The European market was targeted and marketed under the Swiss Summer Camp brand. The FT-100 transceiver from 1966 was basically a new germ, a new kind of radio which incorporated many separate pieces into one small box. With a built-in 12-volt DC and AC mains power supply, the FT-100 offered easy mobile or base single sideband operation to hams all over. It's mainly solid state, a real hybrid. This kept the size and the power consumption down. 25 germanium transistors, 32 diodes, and three vacuum tubes were used in the FD100 single sideband AM CW transceiver. The transmit power was about 150 watts and used a pair of 6JM6 compactrons. 
It was pretty slick looking too and full of features. And it was affordable. The 100B and the FTDX100 Yesu soon followed in the late 60s. The line was first imported to the U.S. in 1965, and ads started to show up in the ham magazines. Some radios sold in the U.S. market during the late 60s, but it really was limited. There were some separates that became popular for a time, but the U.S. manufacturers still dominated the U.S. market. Australia got the FT-101 in October 1970, very early. Europe and Australia had the bug. They had the Yesu bug. It was like a Yesu pandemic had hit Europe and Australia. The first FT-101 transceivers started appearing in the United States in 1971 after some early distribution. They were imported through U.S. importers and through other channels. The U.S. military personnel returning from Vietnam played a huge role with the FT-101. They would stop in Tokyo on their way home, take a train to the Hakibara Electronics District, and buy a rig at these fantastic exchange rates. Basically, it would be like buying a $2,500 radio for $1,000. Such quality features as plug-in circuit boards, expensive tuning gear mechanisms, these caught the eye of knowledgeable hams everywhere. Word quickly spread of this amazing new rig from a company called Yesu, and the production of radios was quickly ramped up to meet the growing demand. The Vietnam guys would also load up on these giant reel-to-reel -reel and large stereo systems. So the Japanese juggernaut was absolutely loose, and word was out. After the first 25,000 or so FT-101 rigs were produced, a major upgrade was made, yielding improvements in many areas, primarily in the receiver. Although this was never given a model name on its own, such as FT-101 Alpha, it nonetheless represented a major set of changes to circuit boards. After about a year of the latter version's production, another set of upgrades came about, including the addition of 160 meters. This model came to be known as the FT-101B, and both owners of the previous FT-101s and the new buyers pushed the production capacity of the Yesu factories to their limits once again. The FT-101 revolutionized the modern de-expedition. Before the FT-101 came along, expedition operators had to drag along separate transmitters and receivers, or a transceiver and a heavy power supply. There was no escaping the two-box syndrome. So let's look at some of the FT-101's design highlights. The FT-101 brought a number of innovations and sought-after features. Built-in AC and DC power supplies. Built-in WWV reception. A factory-sealed VFO with a 1 kHz readout. A pair of 6JS6C TV sweep tubes for high output power. Fully adjustable Vox. A built-in speaker. Plug-in computer-type circuit boards for easy servicing, card extension, and so on. The first use of computer-type plug-in circuit cards was a significant factor in the popularity of the FT-101 series. Not only did the plug-in boards produce a clean, well-organized interior to the design for the transceiver, they made servicing a breeze. The extension board could be fitted underneath the board being worked on, providing easy access to the alignment points for the tech. One of the most effective ads ever produced for the FD-101 showed a circuit board with a postage stamp on it. The message was very simple. If a problem could be narrowed down to a particular board, you just send the board in instead of the entire heavy radio. This philosophy worked. Hams got it. Another hallmark of the FD-101 series was the fantastic mechanical design inside and out. Premium quality ball drives and gear mechanisms were utilized in many areas giving the FT-101 distinctly a quality Collins feel during operation. The drive for the preselector control, for example, found its way into the production of many more modern radios like the FT-901 and the FT-101 Z Delta in years that followed. These radios are still highly sought by collectors. So the FT-101 truly is the radio, the radio that changed ham radio forever. It became an important presence in the U.S. amateur radio market with the introduction and improvement of its popular FT-101 line of equipment in the 70s.
In addition, transceiver manufacture was finally outsourced to Henry Radio in Los Angeles to take up the tremendous demand. By the mid-1970s, the FT-101 was starting to gain attention as a lightweight carry-on type radio. My ham friend and a former boss at Analog Devices told me a cool FT-101 story. Some of you DXers might know him, K1DG, Doug Grant. Along with his buddy and fellow college student, K1MM, and Bill's new FT-101, they all decided they needed to get some sun and some DX in 1975. The FT-101B fit nicely as a carry-on. This is what separated the 101 from many other options. You just carry it on the plane. By the way, congratulations to Doug, who's still a committee member of the CQ Worldwide Contest and a past president of the Yankee Clipper DX Club of Boston. He's medaled three times in the World Radio Sport competitions, and he's in the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. Okay, it's time to talk about Yesu's serial numbering system. I was hoping that I had a problem, child, an original FT-101 radio with a serial number below 25,000. But the serial number looked like it was 119,374. Well, actually, I was not decoding Yesu's secret numbering system properly. Position 1 is the year made, so 1 equals 1971. Don't ask me how they came up with leaving off the decade. Position 2 Position 2 is the month, starting with C. So C equals January. That makes sense, right? So the N means December, of course. Then position 3 and 4 are the lot number. So mine was lot 11. Positions 5 to 8 are the sequence of that lot. So I've got radio 9374. So adding it all up, my radio was built in December of 1971, part of lot 11, 9,374th radio of that lot. This is a very early import radio, probably brought in through Spectronics in California, or possibly it's a Vietnam baggage radio. In any case, it's early, and it came in before that 25,000 number. Only the module numbers will give it away as truly being early, though. So let's take a look inside the radio. So I do like the half-turn deuce-type screws that are in the top. That's very professional, very military-looking. And the cover comes right off. That's beautiful. Now, in this very early unit, the crystal deck or the fixed oscillator is going to be a different number than even the upgraded units. So this is going to be the secret. We need to lift this guy up, look underneath, and see if we can identify the PB number. That's probably the quickest way to give it away. And we could dig into other modules, but this one's readily accessible. It's just two screws on top. The paint you know, hasn't been disturbed, so this has never been disturbed before. Let's lift this thing up. Now these fasteners are all metric, of course. Lifting up the module. What do I see? Oh, it's upside down. Can you possibly read that? PB1060 slash A. PB1060A. That is very early. Uh, that, in fact, puts this transceiver not only within the first 25,000, but within the first 23,000 that use that board. Now to the ordinary ham that was using the FT-101, especially in portable operation, uh, where you're using vehicular power or taking it with you on a vacation or a just moving uh, the radio around, having that internal power supply capability, both 12 volts and 120 volts built in, was a big deal. The performance of those early radios, the first ones that were imported into the United States, 
1971, 72, 73, it was discovered that there were issues with the front end receiver performance, notably the image uh, overload with strong signals, and also there was some noted spurs in the transmitter. Now, these would not be really noticed or discovered by the average ham. They would be, however, discovered by the de-expeditions and the serious hams that uh, at that time were using the Collins KWM-2A routinely on de-expeditions. So if this radio was going to compete in that league, it had to have excellent receiver performance. Noise blanking, uh, excellent uh, compressor, and other features that would put it in the same league as the Collins and have some extra features that maybe the Collins didn't have. One of the most important parts of de-expedition operation is the idea of using split frequencies. To be able to operate the radio on receive frequency that's separated from the transmit frequency. And uh, Yesu, of course, wanted to compete in that de-expedition field very badly. And they developed the FV-101 to go with the transceiver, which allows split operation. So you can see that this radio was going to be used on de-expeditions because you didn't need that external power supply. Having the built-in power supply and a luggable type transceiver was the key to them dominating the market. But they had to improve the performance of the transceiver to truly compete with the KWM-2A. So many think that this is the germ of how the Fox Tango Club was created, where American hams that were able to do uh, measurements on the transceiver were able to feed back information directly to the Japanese engineers and the innovations and the improvements that were brought in would show up in the later models, first with the FT-101B, and then with the later models all the way up to the double E. And uh, continuous improvement was the idea of Fox Tango's relationship with Yesu. So do I expect to have issues bringing the FT-101 back to life? I certainly do. One of the reasons I've been looking for this radio specifically is to explore some of these shortcomings. And I wanted to be able to work with the original radio that broke up the American manufacturing market. This is a disruptor, a disruptive technology. The FT-101 represents a technology that changed American manufacturing to the point where a lot of the ham radio manufacturers had to get into military contracting and commercial areas and leave the ham radio market altogether. The idea of Japanese production, both from a, uh, a scale standpoint compared to the American companies, you can see huge amounts of test and evaluation technicians and piles of radios in some of those pictures. I can assure you that ham manufacturing plants were not like that. There might have been two or three main engineering type personnel that designed the radios, whereas in the Japanese factories, there were whole teams put on radios. So it's a, a different ball game. And uh, really with the difference in the production pay in Japan compared to the US at that time, the US manufacturers really didn't stand a chance once these Japanese radios hit the market and probably by 1980, it was pretty much all over. It's about as far as I want to go with this first video on the FT-101. Step one is uh, disassembly and cleaning as much as we can or as much as we dare, inspecting the cards, seeing what shape we're in, and gaining familiarity with the technical manual.